it's good to be alive and well and praising God on a Sunday morning. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying your walk with the Lord. I know I'm enjoying mine. I want to continue studying what he's been showing me out of Mark chapter 4. You say, good Lord, Gary, how long is this going to last? I don't know, <laughs> and I don't care. I want to I want to squeeze every drop of revelation knowledge and anointing that we can out of the word of God. I thought I already understood Mark chapter 4 and you know we all do to a measure we thank God for everything he does for us and he walks with us as b little babies and he walks with us as we grow and hopefully we're coming into some maturity now and uh, he can reveal a little more to us, you know. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. But uh, And again, I, I would like to recommend to you, if you have not heard the previous lessons uh, that started on this, especially the last three weeks, where I talked about the elm tree, I talked about the rusty fence post. You know, If you haven't heard those, you're going, what? <laughs> elm tree, fence post? There is no way today we can hardly even touch on those again because we've got farther ground to go. But if you have not heard those, uh, I really recommend you ought to just shut this off right now and go back and listen to them. And uh, this whole series started actually back uh, in June, I believe it was, uh, roughly June 13th or thereabouts. And uh, it's been progressive since then. You don't have to go back and listen to them, but I believe it'll build a more sure foundation under you if you do. <laughs> now, don't tell anybody this. I've been going back and listening to them myself, <laughs> and I hardly ever go through one without getting another little glimpse. You know, the Word of God is like this multifaceted diamond, and same way you can take a diamond and just turn it like this and see all the little different glistening facets. That's the way the Word of God is, and we're sure getting some more facets <laughs> in these last days. And uh, Okay, so without further ado, we'll begin today's message. And uh, the t uh, this one I have the title on at the beginning. Uh, it's called, The Imagination is Your Spiritual Womb. Now, that may not mean much to you at the beginning, but by the time we get to the end of this lesson, I think it'll mean a lot to you. <clears throat> So in review, I'm going to take a few minutes to review. I'm going to read again the parable, the portion. Well, really, it's the parable that Jesus taught, the first parable he taught after teaching the sower sows the word. I'm not going to be teaching the sower sows the word exactly. We're really studying this parable where Jesus explains how the kingdom works. And, you know, it's important to know how the kingdom works. If this is the kingdom that you're in and this is how we're to function in a different kingdom on planet earth we're in this kingdom here but we're not of that kingdom so here's the good news our in our kingdom overrules the world's kingdom but it only if we know how it works okay we're going to go to mark chapter 4 and again verses 26 through 29 okay here we go again and he said so is the kingdom of god as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put, putteth in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Now, we've already taught so many things out of this parable. I want to do a quick review here, and it's not a, uh, inclusive. I'm just hitting the highlights. If you want inclusive, go back and watch the previous weeks. But number one, the seed we know is the Word of God. Jesus plainly says that. The thing we know about the Word of God, it's incorruptible. It never changes. It's a... Uh, it's alive. Hebrews tells us that the Word of God is alive. It's, it says it's quick and powerful. That means it's, it's alive. And the word powerful there is not dunamis like we normally think. 
It's ener energy. It's where we get our word energy from. It's full of energy. The Word of God is alive, and it's full of energy. Okay, got that? Number two, the ground is your heart. And the good news is, we found from the prophet Ezekiel in the last few weeks, God promised at the new birth to take out that old stony heart. You remember Jesus talking about stony heart? And, uh, well, we have good news because the prophet Ezekiel prophesying way into the future when the new birth would become available. Says God says, I'm going to take out that old stony heart of yours, the one that won't believe, you know, the one that's good. It's not good ground. I'm going to take that one out, and I'm going to put a new heart in you, and I'm going to put my spirit in you. Uh, listen, what he really did at the new birth, he has recreated you using the spiritual DNA of Christ himself. See, in the same way physically that we were born of Adam, and we didn't receive Adam's personal human spirit, Adam has his own personal human spirit, but we, we received the DNA, the spiritual DNA of a sinner from the first Adam when we were born for our mother's womb. That's the ground you know, the prophet Jeremiah said, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? <laughs> it's deceitful. Well, that's true if you're a child of Adam. And, you you know, uh, you can't, can the leopard change his spots? No, you can't fix yourself. You can't change yourself. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. It's not a suggestion. It's a good idea you should be born again. <laughs> no, you must be born again and part of the reason why so you can receive this new spirit which is cut from the same cloth shoveled from the same ground has the same dna as the ultimate believer himself jesus christ you you were born to believe born again i'm talking about you were born again to believe the word of god don't you ever let the devil tell you again that you're not able to believe. No, this is another grace thing. God did this by his grace. He took out that old stony, unbelieving heart, and he put a new heart in you. And it's, it's, it's again, it's the DNA. It's, it's got the same DNA as the spiritual, yeah, the same spiritual DNA as the ultimate believer, Jesus Christ himself. Oh, my goodness. Now, you may have it cluttered up with, too many things of the world and, and uh, you know, uh, busyness and occupied with too many things. But, hey, stones can be removed. Thorns can be burned up. You can, you can increase more ground. And let me tell you, the ground that's in you if you're born again, if you're a believer at all, if you're born again, you are good. there's a good ground in you. And you can believe the Word of God. Boy, that, that was good news to me. I hope it was to you. We're still reviewing. <laughs> Point number three, now the seed contains the image of the thing hoped for. If you heard the lesson on the elm tree, what, that little bitty, an elm seed is about that big. I've seen thousands of them in my lifetime. Little bitty thing, it, they blow in the wind. They're so light. They, they float across the pasture out there every year. And they're like this big. But once they're planted in the ground... See, there's an image of an elm tree in that seed. But the substance of the tree is not in the seed. The substance, the, everything that produced that seed came out of the ground. And that's exactly what Jesus said in this parable. He said, the earth brings forth the fruit. The earth does, not the seed. The earth does. Well, we'll explain why here in just a minute. But let me say again, the seed contains the image of the thing hoped for. The image is, I get this sentence. The image in the seed is of the thing not yet seen. <laughs> Hope is where, is where you see it before you see it. <laughs> now again, if you've heard those previous lessons, see my dad saw a shade tree where there was no shade tree. 
There, what was there? A little bitty sapling about six inches tall that any of us could have pulled out with one hand or we'd been mowing them down, but this one was just in the right spot. And my dad saw a tree before there was a tree. Well, that's called hope. We'd like to have a shade tree right there. Well, he saw, he saw a tree before there was a tree to be seen, really. Saw a little sapling. That's quite a bit different than what that elm tree eventually became, okay? Now, the ground, number four, item four, the ground contains the substance to produce the image. Whatever seed, whatever image you plant in that ground, its job is to dissolve the husk, get to the germ, that's where the life is, that's where the image is, and its job is to supply every single resource. Think about in the natural for like an elm tree, I don't know what all the components, but I'm sure there's minerals that come out of the ground into that thing to make wood. I don't know what it is, manganese, zinc, <laughs> whatever makes up an elm tree came out of the ground, not out of the seed. The seed has the image. The ground has the substance. Okay. Now, I want to say that sentence again. The ground contains the substance to produce the image. The reason for that is the kingdom of God is within you. Well, what do you mean the kingdom of God is within you? Remember Jesus saying that? Don't be going here and going there looking. He says, no, the kingdom of God is within you. Gary, and for years it didn't make any sense to me either. I'm going, I, I receive it by faith. I, I put this on the shelf over here. Uh, the kingdom of God is within me. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, but I had no understanding of what that meant. Or, uh, you know, again, I'm an engineer. I like practical things. Scientists like formulas. They like E equal MC squared. You know, after they leave the room, the engineer walks in, sees their notes all over the floor, and they pick it up, and they go, oh, E equal MZ squared? Hmm, I think I can use this to make a toaster that'll bless people. <laughs> you know? Well, I like practical things. So I didn't know for years what he meant when he said the kingdom of God is within you. And it probably means more than I understand now, but I sure know more now than I understood then. Commercial break. Pray in tongues. <laughs> Pray the understanding. Pray the mysteries of the word of God. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but unto God. No man understands him. How be it in the spirit he speak in mysteries. And trust me, like Pastor Dave would always say, while those mysteries are being communicated, you're not explaining mysteries to God. No, he is explaining mysteries to you. Pray in tongues. Okay. Now, why is the kingdom of God within you? Because the Spirit of Christ is in you. You remember Romans 8, verse 9, the last part of it, it says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Well, say, I'm his. I'm born again. I ask, I ask Christ, I ask Jesus to come into my heart. Okay, good, good. Then agree with the Bible that you have the Spirit of Christ within you. But see what we haven't realized. When we ask Jesus to come into our heart, we didn't understand the kingdom came with the king. <laughs> if you got Christ in your heart, you know the creator lives in you. He has access through you to this entire world. What do you mean the creator? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And he, um, he created all. By him were all things created. And without him was nothing made that was made. That's not perfect, but it's close enough. The word has always been the creator is the point. And now the word has been sown in you. You are good ground. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. <laughs> now here's an amazing thing. That phrase, the kingdom of God is within you. I'm a little bit of a Bible nerd, as you probably know. and I just I got curious, within you. I just wondered, how many times in the Bible was that phrase used, just within you? So I did a little, you know, computer search, they're easy. Just search for this phrase, within you, Old Testament and new. Those exact words in the King James Bible are only found four times. And all four of them 
have to do with the new birth. All four of them have to do with God putting new ground on the inside of you. Now here's what I mean. If you do a computer search just on a King, for a King James Version Bible and just search for the phrase within you, here are the four verses and only four verses you're going to find. I'll just read them to you. Ezekiel 11, verse 19. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. Well, that's talking about the new birth. That's prophesying about what's coming. Okay, the second one is in Ezekiel 36, verse 26. And actually, 20, the third one is verse 27, so I'm going to read them together. Here's number two and number three. So Ezekiel 36, starting with 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. That's other than Jesus. The fourth one is Jesus in, in the New Testament, Luke 17, 21, where he says, neither shall they say lo here or lo there for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. There it is. That's, that's the only four times that the phrase within you is in the King James Bible, and all four of them have to do with you receiving new ground, a new spirit that can believe God at the new birth. Glory to God. What are the odds of that? I just think that's amazing. All right, number five. On our, we're still reviewing. 17 minutes. I got a little clock on here. 17 minutes, and we're still reviewing. Sorry. It's a lot. <laughs> and believe it or not, we're going to get a lot more today. All right? Now, number five, <clears throat> the image in the seed must remain in contact with the ground long enough for the image and the ground to be in intimate contact. Many seeds, number six, many seeds have a husk to protect the germ of the seed until it's planted in the ground. And the first thing the ground does is try to dissolve the husk so it can get in contact with the germ, the life, the image within the seed. Now, if you heard the, the message I did a week ago about the post, we planted these old pipes. Planted. <laughs> we were making fence posts out of old gates and stuff that was available to us, and we'd cut that pipe up with a blowtorch and, and use them for fence posts. And... Uh, put them in the ground. I even sprayed aluminum paint on the bottom two or three feet of them because they were already old. It's old pipes. And uh, we was trying to keep them from rusting so fast. And then seven years later, they had rusted so much that they were starting to lean. Three, three or four of them, the fence was leaning out like that. We knew they'd about rusted through. Now what, as I dug those old posts up and I'm looking at how severely rusted, I mean, there was hardly anything left. That pipe, metal pipe, was paper thin. You could just crush it with your hand. And then, I, you know, I was thinking, what, why does ground rust a metal pipe? And it was years and years until I started understanding these things that I got it. See, the ground doesn't know you put a pipe in it. For all it knows, you planted a big seed. And what it's trying to do, to do is grow that pipe. <laughs> it's do, it's ang, ang. immediately, it's going, I, I got to dissolve the husk. There's got to be a, a germ. There's a life. There's an image in here that I'm supposed to produce. Ang, ang. Rust is that ground trying to dissolve the husk. It's trying to get to the image of that big honking seed you put in there. <laughs> it's going, boy, that's a big seed. And for seven years, that ground was faithful, faithful. It never slept. I slept and rose night and day, but the ground that never quit. I remember, your heart is the good ground. You can sleep and rise night and day, and your, your ground, the heart of you, is going, <laughs> it, it's working to grow that seed that you plant in it. And we can... 
I'm starting to get blessed again. Feet, you got to stay here. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's good news. Now, the in, now back to a real seed, not a fence post. Okay, you put a seed in the ground. Some seeds hardly have any husk at all, but some seeds do. But regardless, once the husk has been dissolved and the ground and the germ, uh, the life, the image, let's say the image, once the husk has been removed and the image is revealed, there's life in every seed. God puts life in every seed. Man still can't make a seed that will grow. They've tried, but they can't. There's a miracle of life in every seed that man cannot to this day, even with all of our ingenuity and te technology, can't make a seed. We can't produce a seed that will grow. God has to do that. But he did do it. There's a miracle in every natural seed that makes it grow. There's a miracle in every seed of the Word of God that makes it grow. And that part's it's in the seed. But see, now back to our natural ground for just a minute. You planted a seed, the ground, it dissolves the husk. But as soon as the husk is dissolved and the image in that seed is revealed, the ground goes to work. That's called conception. At that moment, the ground starts providing every nutrient, every vitamin, I don't know what's in a tree, every mineral, everything that is needed to produce the image that's in that seed. Think about a, a woman who wants to have a baby. Now, she can want to have a baby all she wants to, but she's never going to have a baby without there being... I'm, I'm going to keep it nice. Intimate, personal contact with a male. <laughs> okay. I, I want a baby. Well, uh, you should get married and have a close personal relationship with a man. Oh, I don't want a man involved. I, <laughs> I just want the baby. Well... And that nowadays with modern technology, in some ways, it seems they can get around that, but really not. Still yet, the seed of a male and the egg of a woman are going to have to come in, still going to have to come in contact, okay? You can wish for a baby all you want. You can want to have a baby all you want, but you're, you yourself are not going to have a baby without an egg in you coming in intimate contact with the seed from a male. That's just the way it is, okay? Same thing, a person might want a garden. Oh, I want a flower garden. I want, I love these beautiful flowers and I want to have a flower garden, okay? Have you planted any seeds? Well, no. <laughs> I, just, I, just want, I just want the garden. I, I see me, I see, we talked about imagination last week. We're going to talk about it this week too. But, oh, I, I see me having a, a great garden. Well, that's good. God, would, God likes gardens. The Garden of Eden was wonderful. God likes gardens. Have you, how much seed have you planted? Oh, I haven't planted any seed. I just want flowers. <laughs> now listen, we can illustrate this process in a very negative way. Okay? This one I'd like for you to look up in your Bible or your smartphone. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. Because the imagination is so important in this um, conceptual process. Conceptual is okay. The process of conceiving. My, how do I do that nicely? Okay. Okay, I think that'll come up a little later in the lesson or maybe next week. Or maybe soon if it keeps coming. I don't know how to do it nicely yet. Anyway, <laughs> Genesis 6 and verse 5. Genesis 6 and verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every, now notice, imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, it's, 
several things are important here. Number one, notice it's the imagination of the heart. That's not by accident. It's not just in the mind. This has gotten deeper than the mind. It's gotten into the deep thinking, the, the heart. We're going to, uh, I'll just read it now. Uh, Proverbs says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. See, what you really think about things or yourself, that's, that's how you really are. Now, there's a process of change, but that change is not complete until you change how you think in your heart, not just your mind, in your heart. If you want permanent change, that change is going to come in the heart, not just the mind. Say, so, well, that, doesn't that violate uh, Romans 12, too, that we be transformed by the renewing of our mind? But see, if you leave that all in context, he's, he's been talking about praying in tongues and the spirit of wisdom and, and revelation knowledge and the new birth. Everything that Paul had taught for 11 chapters, he said, therefore, <laughs> everything he taught for 11 chapters, he's summing up here. So it's not just talking about the mind. He's talking about the heart. And the mind is one of the gateways for the heart. But as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now back to Genesis 6-5. I've got to show you something here. that'll. It, uh, this blew my hat in the creek when I discovered this. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart, so the thoughts of the heart combined with imagination, in this case, was only evil continually. Now that word imagination is uh, Strong's H-3336. In the Hebrew, it's uh, Y-E-T-S-E-R, Yetzer maybe. That same Hebrew word, now get this, man, that same Hebrew word is translated five times in the Old Testament as imagination. And it means a form, a frame, uh, a thing framed, like a, it's an image. Uh, it's the imagination. Uh, it's, it's the mind. It's work. Figuratively, though, and this is Strong's, figuratively, what it means is conception. My dad, for many years, was a superintendent for a major construction company here in Oklahoma, and we'd travel from town to town. We lived in a mobile home, a nice one, in those days. And uh, every new town, uh, he'd have a he'd be superintendent over building of a. Uh, a bank building or a, a, an office building of some kind, usually six, seven stories. And, it, you know, take about six months to get the thing built, and then we move on to the next town. I've lived, Again, I, I went to 13 different schools between the first and sixth grade because we moved about every six months. It's a miracle I can read, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, my dad had the instruction in the form of blueprints and my dad only had like an eighth grade education. And he taught himself to be able to read blueprints. My dad had to see the building before there was a building, and the blueprints helped with that. He, could, he had the capacity to look at that piece of paper and see how, how to do that, how to make it. Okay, That's the imagination. When you can do that before there's a building there, all that's happening in your imagination. See, the, the hope is for a building. Well, we don't have a building. What do you have? I have an image. I've got a blueprint. Oh, well, if you do what's on the blueprint, you'll have a building. <laughs> so here it says, the imagination of their thoughts, and it's the real word for imagination, that word yetzer. In that case, the imagination was evil all the time, and it's why they kept doing evil stuff. I said all that to say this. One of our most often quoted verses, Isaiah 26, verse 3. I'm going to give you a moment to get there. Isaiah 26, verse 3. 
And I don't know if you write in. See, one thing I don't like about the digital Bibles, and there's a lot of things I do like about them. I, I use them all the time. But I can't write in the margin. <laughs> now, you can add notes. I know that. You can add notes and think to the, to the better software. I'm old school. I, man, you ought to see my old Bibles. I got notes everywhere. That doesn't mean you can steal my Bible. You know, people used to steal Pastor Dave's Bible. He got to where he was buying these little cheap $6 Bibles because he said, well, I never know when they're going to steal it. <laughs> Come to church and steal the pastor's Bible. Why? They wanted the notes. But Dave wasn't a note taker. You look at his Bible, all you're going to find is little dots, sometimes one dot, sometimes two dots, sometimes three dots. And that was a code for him that told him things and what to do. Remind, he said, the verses are my notes. The, you know, they're the one, I, I read that verse and I have a teaching in here that corresponds with that verse. The, 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 the verses are the notes that trigger the revelation. So he, anyway, I just thought, our pastor happened to buy cheap $6 Bibles because people kept stealing them. <laughs> okay, now I got to set it up again. All right, in Genesis 6, 5, when he says, that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart were evil continually. In Isaiah 26, 3, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. You better strap yourself down. That word mind in Isaiah 26, 3 is the exact same word translated imagination in Genesis 6-5. So you could read it this way. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose imagination is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Oh, so many verses we could go to right now. So many. When I found that out, I'm telling you, revelation knowledge is like a running stream when it's really God, and it's it's always really simple, really, and it runs like a running stream from Genesis to maps. I mean, you don't have to try and pound, you know, square pegs into round holes, and, you know. I mean, it just fits. It flows like a running. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Yeah, that word affection. It's more than the mind. It includes the heart, your emotions. It, oh, anyway, I, if I go that direction, we won't finish today's lesson. I'll have to retitle everything. <laughs> uh, this lesson's really good. You, uh, or they're all really good because it's God's word. You know, I'm just the donkey. I'm the. I, I get my little donkey pat afterwards. Good, good job, little donkey. All right, I'm the donkey he rides in on. Okay. Now. You can tell from Genesis 6-5 that God knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. And he holds us accountable for what we imagine. Jesus reinforced this in the New Testament, if you want to know the truth about it. When he said, if you lust in your heart after a, a woman to commit adultery, just the lusting part makes you guilty. You've already done it as far as God's concerned. If you hate in your heart, you really hate somebody and want them dead, you've already committed murder. Now, he's really talking about your imagination. He's not just talking about an idle thought that came by, you know. Kenneth Hagin says, you know, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair. Now, what Jesus is talking about there is more than an idle thought. It's when you start seeing it and thinking about it, maybe seeing yourself involved in it, <laughs> you know. If you're thinking about it, wanting it to come to pass, lusting after it in your imagination, well, you've already, you're already guilty. Now, the point of that is God knows the intents of the heart, and he does hold us accountable for it. Your actions are just a byproduct of how you think in your heart, in your heart now. I want to say it again. That sentence is too important. Your actions are just a byproduct of how you really think in your heart. And again, that's Proverbs 23, 7. I hope I gave the right reference earlier. 
As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Change starts with changing the way you think in your heart. Now, really, it starts, I think, with your mind. You know, you, the mind is a gateway to the heart, okay? I mean, when you first heard the gospel the very first time, uh, you heard it with your mind. You, somebody preaching with your outer ear or reading it with your eyes, some, some, one of the input sensors <laughs> got it into you, and it, in your mind first. But when you started meditating on it and thinking about it and believing to act on it, like going forward at an altar call or bowing in your living room like I did, and receiving it, it goes from head knowledge to heart knowledge. It's something you know in your heart, not just your head. I want to say that sentence again. It's too important. Change starts with changing the way you think in your heart. Now get this. Change has to be conceived in the heart using the imagination. You'll see what I mean in just a minute. And this is the title of today's lesson. The imagination is the womb of your spirit. Or said another way, the imagination is your spiritual womb. It's where you conceive things. It's where conception takes place. Last week, I brought up the fact that in Psalms 1-2, you know, Dave would teach us eloquently. They talk about in, in the, uh, the man who doesn't want to walk in the, the ways of the world and he meditates in the law of the Lord day and night. Well, you know, that's all they had was the law of the Lord. So we, today we would say he meditates in the word of God day and night. And that word meditate in the next Psalm, Psalms 2 verse 1, it says, why do the kings rage and the heathen imagine a vain thing? I'll never forget the day that I found out that the word meditate in Psalms 1, 2, is the identical Hebrew word as imagine in Psalms 2, 1. Meditation involves the imagination or it's not meditation. Hmm. Now, I was listening to my good friend, uh, Pastor Bronk Flint, by the way. I said, Gary, how many messages did you miss of Pastor Bronk's? None. I don't miss any of them. I don't, I don't get too busy. I might get behind a week or two. I catch up. I haven't missed a Pastor Bronk message in years. I don't miss Pastor Jim Martin. I don't miss Pastor Alan Taylor. Uh, those are the ones that I don't miss. Now, there's others that I sporadically listen to, but I don't miss those because I know they're on the same path. We're all on the same uh, journey. Uh, I don't miss any of them. And I get iron sharpens iron. Every time I hear one of them preach, I usually get a little insight or something said a little different way. That they tell me the same thing happens when they listen to me. And the same with Alan. Uh, and there's others, but those are my don't misses. I don't miss those. Uh, I need every brick. It's like this brick wall behind me. I need every brick in that wall. Dave used to say revelation knowledge is like a brick wall. It's like line upon line, line upon line precept upon precept until eventually you, your, your walls are, are erected and now you can put the roof on there. Well, the roof that we're after is revival and I don't need any gaps in my wall. <laughs> so, praise God. Anyway, so I was li this week, uh, and I listened to Jim Martin also, but this week something Bronx said just went off in me because he was talking similar, uh, similar message including using the imagination. He, he focused more on the word, the Greek word for that, which is parable. And I really recommend you listen to his message. Uh, it was Wednesday night of this week, whatever date that, that was. So, I was so I'm just going to read here for a minute. I was listening to my friend Pastor Bronk teach a message along this same line during this past week. I get insights while Bronk while listening to Bronk, he, he says he gets insights listening to me. Iron sharpens iron. It accelerates the growth process as we share what we've learned. 
I recommend you listen to Pastor Bronk's message. Here, I do have the date. The one that he delivered on a Wednesday, September 14th, 2022. I recommend you listen to that. Okay, Bronk. That's all the credit you get. <laughs> We're going on from here. Okay. It's my revelation now. Anyway. He does the same thing with me. Now listen, you can read the story for yourself in Genesis chapter 22, and I don't have enough time on this video to read it. Uh, you're pretty familiar with it. It's talking about when God told Abraham to offer his only son Isaac as a burnt offering. So in the natural realm, really, this made no sense at all. This is Isaac, this is the promised son who was born through the supernatural intervention of God. God had to supernaturally rejuvenate Abraham and Sarah's body in order to even have this boy. And Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Sarah, it said, was, uh, what, 90, 91? Impossible. We've taught so many times. I mean, she wasn't ovulating anymore, and it's from something she said. We know Abraham wasn't a hot rod anymore like he used to be. Shall I have pleasure from my husband again? Tells you a lot. <laughs> okay. God himself had to intervene and rejuvenate their bodies to even make this happen. This was as supernatural as it gets. And now God's saying, I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. It didn't make any sense. Now, it was through this son, Isaac, that the descendants of Abraham would be born. God had already told him, In Isaac shall your seed be called. Not some other son. It's not a, In other words, I'm not telling you to offer this one, then you and Sarah is going to have another son, and through that son, your descendants will come. No, I told you it's through this one, through Isaac. You're, this is it. But now you're telling me to kill him? <laughs> to offer him, well, let's use King James, to offer him as a sacrifice? Kill him. <laughs> so this is the promised son through whom the seed, all of those descendants like the stars, will come. But Isaac's not, he hadn't even married yet. He has not produced any children at all. This command from God seems to nullify the promise of God. How in the world, God, can my seed come through Isaac if you're asking me to end his life? I, I don't understand. Well, how did Abraham resolve this seeming conflict in order to obey God? We really don't find the answer till the New Testament, all the way to the book of Hebrews. And it, the answer to that question has everything to do with the imagination. And let me, or you can turn to Hebrews 11. Starting in verse 17, we're going to do Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac, in Isaac, shall thy seed be called, according, no, accounting, that God, now accounting, that means he, he logically, accountingly, like an accountant, he, he accounted, he, he, he came to this conclusion that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he received, now get this, from whence he received him in a figure Abraham's inner thoughts, his accounting process, may have run something like this. Well, God promised that my seed, the ones that's going to number like the stars of heaven, they're going to come through Isaac. Yet now, he is commanding me to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Hmm. Well, I know God cannot lie. See, the thing about Abraham, he trusted God. That verse we read earlier, 
in Isaiah 26, 3, that verse we read earlier, Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Notice the last part. Because he trusteth in thee. The one thing about Abraham, he trusted in God. So Abraham came to just one conclusion. My seed is going to come through Isaac. Isaac hasn't had any children yet. God's telling me to offer him as a sacrifice. There's only one conclusion. Well, God's going to raise my son from the dead. Now that's, uh, you got to see this verse. Look at Genesis 22 and verse 5. Now this is as they're, him and Isaac are about to go up the mountain. They, they've arrived at the mountain, and they're leaving the donkeys and whoever came with them at the base of the mountain. And Abraham and Isaac are about to walk up the mountain. Isaac's going to carry the firewood. He's a young man, by the way. He's, a, he's not a child. He's at least a teenager and most likely in his early 20s. He's a, he's a, he's a grown man, I think. He's carrying the firewood, <laughs> enough to burn a body. Okay. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide you here with the ass. Now notice. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. You see, Abraham had a vision. Abraham had received Isaac in a figure. Abraham was looking past the time of the offering of Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham fully intended to sacrifice Isaac. You got to understand that. No pretending here. God's looking on the heart. And when God counted it as a done. When Abraham raised up that knife, God's looking on the heart. He goes, He's going to do this. I count this as done. Abraham fully intended to sacrifice Isaac, but get this. He, Abraham also fully intended to walk back down that mountain with Isaac walking right beside him. Excuse me. <laughs> no wonder Abraham is called the friend of God. No wonder the Bible says, and Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It doesn't get more real than offering up your child. Come on. And it's also, <laughs> doesn't get more real. This is life and death for Isaac. I got to tell you, it's more than that. It's life and death for you and me. You'll understand what I mean by that in just a minute. But Abraham, he saw all of this in his imagination. He pondered, he pondered it, he meditated on it until he saw what, what had to happen. Well, God's going to have to raise him from the dead. And he conceived this in his heart based on the Word of God and on the character of God. Listen, the Bible says God has exalted his word above his name. See, if God's word is no good, then God is no good. Sorry, it's just witness. My dad taught me that from the time I was a little boy. He said, son, no, he didn't say son, boy. <laughs> Even when I was a grown man, boy, <laughs> your word is all you've got. If your word is no good, you're no good. The word, will, it, the word will spread whether your word is good or not. You always do what you say. And I don't care if you made a mistake and it's costing you a thousand dollars an hour. You're going to do what you say because your word is all you got. And if your word is no good, you're no good. And I found that to be true. But see, God is good. Jesus said, who is good but God alone? Well, God is good. But as good as he is, he's exalted his word even above that. He's saying, look, if my word is no good, I'm no good. But God is good. And Abraham somehow knew God would not lie. So Abraham knew God well enough that he knew that God would not break his word. And if God was commanding Isaac to die, well, Abraham worked it out like an accountant. He's, he said, well, then there's only, one, there's only one result. There's only one possible thing. God's going to have to raise him from the dead. And he didn't mean 20 years later either. <laughs> Me and the boys walking back down this mountain today. Whew. Come on now. <laughs> today. 
No wonder, again, I got to say it, what faith. No wonder the Bible calls Abraham the friend of God. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now let's just emphasize this just a little more, shall we? Here Abraham is believing for God to raise his son from the dead. And it dawned on me while I was doing this study. At this point in history, nobody had ever been raised from the dead. <laughs> the first recorded raising of the dead in the Bible is done by the prophet Elijah. And that is centuries later. So Abraham did not have any kind of a track record, no historical record that God ever raised the dead. He had nothing like that at all. In history, nobody had ever been raised from the dead, but bless God, he's got to raise my son from the dead because he promised. He promised, and he can't lie. He promised through this boy, my seed shall be like the stars of heaven. My God can't lie. And if he's telling me to do this, he's got a reason I don't understand. But I understand this. He can't lie. He's got to raise Isaac from the dead in order not to break his word to me. God. Sorry, but I'm not sorry. I love the word of God. I love God. We've got to become a people that has faith like Abraham. How in the world is unregenerate man who wasn't born again had such faith? I thank God that he had it, and I thank God that God found him and made a covenant with him. Thank God for Abraham. You're going to see even more so why in a minute. Oh, Lord, I'm going to have to hurry this up, son. <laughs> How did Abraham receive his son raised from the dead? Well, Hebrews told us there a while ago, in a figure. The Greek word used there, and this is what Bronk was teaching on Wednesday night, is where we get our English word parable. This is where we get the, I think it was called, I think it was pronounced parable or something like that. Parabole, yeah, that was it, parabole. I don't normally get too much into the pronunciations. I do know this, parabole is where we get our English word parable. And if you look that word up, it means a fictitious narrative. What? It's a story that you tell. But when it's a parable, or you're receiving something in a figure, or using your imagination, it's a story you're telling yourself. It's a story that you imagine in your heart. Abraham created his own parable. Abraham created his own parable by combining the Word of God with his imagination. I'm going to say it a different way. He planted the seed. The seed was, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now that's the seed. That's the image. This boy is going to have kids who's going to have kids who's going to have kids who's going to have kids till the point, till the time comes, your descendants are going to multiply like the stars of heaven. So he mingled what God said. He planted it in the imagination of his heart. This isn't the first time he'd been through this process, remember? Way back when God took him outside the tent on a starry night to look up and say, your descendants are going to number like the stars of heaven. Well, he's looking at stars, not people. But God says, use, basically saying, use your imagination. See children. I want you to see it like this. He had to use his imagination to see those stars as representing his children. Now, how important is the imagination? I want you to think about this. God used Abraham's obedience and covenant relationship to offer up his only begotten son on the cross. If Abraham had not been obedient to this command of God to offer up Isaac, there would have been no legal access for God to intervene by offering his son on a cross to save the world. God used Abraham's imagination as part of his plan 
to save the world through the offering of the Lamb of God on the cross. While listening to Bronk's message this week, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, you are saved because of the imagination of an unregenerate man. And I, I had never thought of that before. See, God never quit. So if Abraham had refused to obey God in this, well, God would have started all over with somebody else. God's not a quitter. But even if he'd have chose somebody else, they too would have one day been brought to the same circumstances because God needed a legal entry via a covenant with man to offer his son as the Lamb of God. There's so much to teach right there, but we've got like four minutes left, so I'm just going to go on with today's lesson. How important is imagination? How important was Abraham's imagination if Abraham hadn't been willing to go through with it? God would not have been legally authorized to offer his son, and we could not be saved. God used the imagination of an unregenerate man to help bring us all to Christ. It boggles the mind. How important is the imagination? As I, as I listened to that message, I received another insight regarding the imagination. Now get this. From the time Abraham received the instruction until the moment he had to plunge the knife into Isaac, that whole time period was only three days. Your imagination can conceive seed quickly if you know how to really get with it. <laughs> I mean, he only had three days. It was three days' journey from where they were camped to that mountain. Three days to develop in your imagination your own parable. And how important is it? Well, in Abraham's mind, he's probably thinking, well, the life of, it's life and death for my son. And Abraham might have gone this far. It's life and death for all of the children that would come through my son. But I, I don't know. Well, Abraham, Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. So Abraham may have even thought, it's life and death for Gary Carpenter. <laughs> what I mean is it's life and death for all of those who will believe on the Messiah, who will come through this line. It's life and death for them too. I'm going to obey God. God's going to raise my son from the dead. God. Mm. But now the point right now is this. In just three days, Abraham was able to conceive this parable in his imagination. How strong is imagination? Listen, in Abram's mind, what he was seeing of God raising his son from the dead was more real than the death of his son through the knife blade. And we confess the word five minutes a day and wonder where our miracle is. Come on. Good. Lord. God cannot lie. God will not break his word. God's word is God. I can trust his promise. My seed is called in Isaac. Isaac has to have children. God will raise him from the dead. Just three days. Just thinking it's going to take, stop thinking, it's going to take years and years to get your healing. We are learning how to accelerate the process. And a big part of it has to do with this using the imagination of Combining the image, hope, with the substance of the soil, which is faith. You combine the two. Be like Abraham and see beyond your present circumstances. Abraham saw him and the boy, him and the lad, walking back down that mountain. He saw it. He only had three days to see it, but he saw it. And it was enough because God's looking on the heart. There's no pretend here. Abraham's going to do it. <laughs> that parable, that story, that truth, that receiving of Isaac in a figure was more real 
than plunging a steel uh, a blade. I don't know what it was made of, but plunging a blade through the heart of his son. You got to see it, and say it. You got to see it, and say it. You got to see it, and say it. That is the Abraham way, and he's called the father of faith for all who believe. Mm. So now I've been taking some time here recently, since I'm understanding this better, to see myself walking straight and upright, like a healed man should. I've been spending time, like, we'll get in more of this later. I've been spending time on purpose, like, you know, just taking five minutes and just imagining Gary Carpenter, the man healed of God. When I take those five minutes, I see and I say, and I try and get it, I try and make the confession as affirmative as is possible. I, I Sometimes I quote verses like, thank you, Lord, that by his stripes I am healed. But what I mainly do is something like this. I see myself walking pain-free, by the way. I can, I can walk up right now, but it's painful as all get out. <laughs> That's the last time you'll hear me say that. <laughs> We're in the process of learning here, okay? All right. But when I see myself, I see myself walking upright, straight and true, with no pain. And I'll say, and it's all, I don't say this every time, but it's all based on the finished work of Jesus. This is all grace. God gave us the believing ground. God gave us the word to sow into the ground. God wants us to have this harvest he wants Gary to have my harvest more than Gary wants it. And trust me, I've got other harvest fields going. This is just one that I can use real simply to teach teach about. So I'll see myself walking pain-free, and I'll say, I am healed. I am pain-free. Lord, I thank you that I can walk uprightly the way you made man to walk. I thank you, Lord. You perfect that which concerns me. I am pain-free. I am healed. I have a perfect back. I am strong. I walk uprightly. I thank you, Lord, you have given me a backbone that is straight and true. I thank you, Lord, that my, my all of my muscles and all of my bones function perfectly the way they're supposed to. I thank you that I am healed and I'm strong. And while I do that, I'm seeing in my imagination. I'm making my parable. I'm, my story, I'm, I'm, I'm predicting my future, really, I really am. Wasn't God predicting Abraham's future when he took him out and showed him the stars? Of course he was. Hallelujah. Well, I'm already over time. I hope you're getting as much out of this as I am. I am having such a great time. I almost feel born again again. I think we're getting really close to some things, and we're going to make the jump here pretty quick right now in order to teach it. We're coming at it this way. But see, but in order to minister it, you come at it a little a, a little different way, a little more mature. And uh, we'll, we'll get there. And uh, I think I'm going as fast as he'll let me go. So until next time, love you. Miss you all so much. Would love to hug all your necks. See you next time. Bye-bye.